Okay, so let's take a look at the handout that you have. Um, the handout that you have is to take a look at the data. I want you, I want you to focus your mind uh, and your eyes on the data. Can you tell me what's wrong? Is there anything wrong? Data collect, just the data collected. The SF. the SF is different. Which one? The first set. The first set. Um, the, you mean the which part? The first row, first set, first column? Uh, the, last three the last three columns. And what is the issue with the SF? The error is the one SF, and the number in front follows the number of DBs. Is the oh, okay. Uh, remember the rule for the S uh, for the error and the SF for the numbers in front. The error is the one SF which is correct, and then the number in front follows the accuracy of the uncertainty. Also, the DC follows. Yes, correct. So the SF need not be constant. But thanks for pointing that out. Um, okay, the problem with this is the recording over here is recorded to 0 0.01 uh, seconds. Yeah, so this is the smallest 0 0.01 seconds. But the problem is, the problem is, can human reaction time be that fast? So let's let's check what's your human reaction time yeah? using the laws that you have uh, learned before. So let's uh, and uh, let's see how fast your reaction. Time. Anyone of these sportsmen over here? Okay, anyone over here? Since you're a sportsman, I assume that your reaction time is the fastest. I don't know whether that's a bold assumption or not. So all I'm going to do is, uh, can I have your finger like this? <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this and as I drop it you try to catch it as fast as you can. Then we're going to make some calculations. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So okay. So let's try out as I drop it. <laughs> I love this. Man. Okay. So let's see. So it's about 17 centimeters and as any good physicist we take average. Yeah. 17 about 17. Okay, with some practice, it is still a 17. <laughs> and last one. Okay, relax, uh, relax, relax. Ah, it's improved. So we take the last one, 13. Thank you. Thank you. Go back. And um, so his data is about 17, 17, 13, which is the average. Can someone just calculate the average? The rough average. 15.6. 0.6. So what happened is that this thing. So uh, this thing dropped through 0 0.156 meters in the time that we have here. Yeah? So we got S, we got G, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. We know U, which is 0. So can you find out what is T? So that would be his reaction time. Yeah? The time where he witnesses the eye registers the ball to the time where his muscles hold it. I haven't witnessed in my whole life where a person has the whole meter rule drop. <laughs> that would be really serious. Though. Anyone? What's the number? 0.18. 0.18, yeah. Okay, good. 0.18 seconds, about that. The, for Olympians, for Olympians, the reaction time is about 0.1 at best. So what happened is that in Olympics, let's say for example swimming, if the force plate register a change in force, that means that the person actually starts to jump off, less than 0.1 seconds is considered a force upgrade. You don't even need to jump like before the horn sound. So if you jump 0.1 seconds after the uh, horn sounds, it means that it is a force upgrade. Because it's not possible. It's just not possible. So if your given reaction time is 0.1 second, let's take it as 0.1 second. Do you think it makes sense for you to register to 0.01 second? It's just not possible, it doesn't make sense, yeah? So the first error in that uh, table of data is that it should not be 0.01, it should be 0.1. Now what's the implication for the rest of the data? Yes, correct. Excellent. So the rest of the data do register, make a note using a pencil or whatever, that it should be 1 dp for the rest of the data. Check the mass, any problem with the mass? Is there any issue with the mass? The recording of the mess, does it look okay? Yeah. yeah, it looks perfect, fine. Yeah. So the error of the mass 0.1 gram, um, it depends on how 
badly mishandled. It has been some people drop their mess and stuff. And since it's metal, I don't expect the mess to change by a lot if they drop it. So one one should be fine. And if you look at the number in front, uh, it's 150.0, so it follows the accuracy, so it's fine. Alright, so we got the data fine, we got the data already. Now then we move on to the next stage, which is processing of data. Now, this equation is something that you need to um, you need to register. So T, which is the period, is equal to 2 pi square root m upon k. Yeah, so this is the period of the oscillating mass over here. Now, if you square everything, t squared equals 4 pi squared m upon k. And you see that if you plot t squared against m, you're going to have a straight line. Make sense? y equals to mx. Now, can you tell me how do you find k then? Oh my God. So 4 pi squared divided by the gradient. Why? Because this is the gradient, which is equal to 4 pi squared divided by k. Therefore, k is equal to 4 pi squared divided by the gradient. Excellent. So let's break down the step one by one. So the first thing that we need to get is t squared. Because we don't have t squared. Agree? Over here, we don't even have t. Not to say t squared. So how do you get period? So the period must be equal to you choose any data over there in the column, you choose any of the data in the three column and then pick it up, or do you do average? Why do you do average? We do random average. Right. So you take t equals to t1 plus t2 plus t3 divided by 3. Is that enough? Is that a period? Sorry? Yes, correct. So then you divide by 3. So you multiply by 1 of k. Okay, then you get your period rate. Now listen very carefully. When you do averaging, do you reduce uncertainty? Do you reduce uncertainty? You reduce random error for sure because you average something like this. Do you decrease? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay, let's say, for example, the, the uncertainty is here because you have the data which is 8.6 plus minus 0.1 plus 8.6 plus minus 0.1 plus if you don't, don't just somehow, somehow you get all 8.6 plus minus 0.1. Then you divide it by 3 and then times 1 over 20. So you get 8.6 plus minus 0.1 times 3 divided by 3 times this one. So nicely cancel out. And then can you see? that the number in front plus minus you got 0 0.1 divided by 3. So do you reduce the uncertainty? Yes, you do. And that's the purpose of taking with the oscillation. Because you reduce the absolute uncertainty. But the next question is more, more important. Do you reduce the percentage uncertainty? Do you reduce the percentage by measurement? Exactly. So do you reduce the percentage uncertainty? You don't. Yes, correct. So even though you reduce the absolute uncertainty, the percentage uncertainty remains unchanged. So how do you reduce percentage uncertainty? More precise. Exactly. More precise. There's no way you can reduce uncertainty by using the same this one. You need to devise a better time measuring technique. Technique or method. Yeah. So there's no way you can reduce percentage uncertainty. It is limited by the instrument you that's a very important point of awareness. What do you reduce? What do you not reduce? So now we got the T, then we move on to, now we got the T, then we move on to T squared. Okay. I'm not sure whether you still remember how to process your uncertainty. So let's see how much of it you still remember. So if you have t squared, let y be equal to t squared. How do you find the uncertainty of t squared? So let's say t is equal to 1.05 plus minus 0 0.01. Same fraction. Yeah? Same fraction. It may not be the actual value, just same fraction. So how do you find t squared? And not. So this is what you do. Delta y upon y, you agree that it's 2 delta t upon t. So delta y is equal to just the delta t squared 
is equal to 2 delta t upon t times y, which is 2 delta t upon t times t squared, because y is t squared. Answer up, answer up. So delta t squared is equal to 2 delta t times t. Now in this context, it will be equal to 2 times 0 0.01, and this will be your answer. Somehow, something you might ask is probably you want to ask this question. Do you have to do this for every set of data? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Yes, you have to do it. Now, if you're smart enough, you can actually create a column for t, you can create a column for delta t, then you create an equation using your Excel spreadsheet. Ta-da! T the equation, then you can just drag and pull. Yeah, click and drag. Then you get all the answers to this one for you. Yeah, so work smart, don't work smart. Yeah, work smart. So you just have to show this equation in your, somewhere in your report and then just click and drag. Yeah, just click and drag. So this is how you find out the t-square. Remember 1sf and the number you can't follow the number of t-keys. So we have gotten t, we have gotten t-square. So what is lacking now before you can find the gradient? You need a? Five letter words starting with G. Come on. Graph. graph, exactly. <laughs> you need a graph. So, what do you need to know uh, to plot the graph? You need to have y axis, you need to have an x axis. Be very mindful, this is second square. This is, uh, the data given to you is in grams, so you have to convert it to G. So for kg, you just need to divide the number and answer it by a thousand. So nothing really difficult. Now, this is the interesting part. If you have t squared plus minus delta t squared and m plus minus delta m, you have learned in your secondary school how to represent this. Yeah, so you probably have points like this. So now you're in the IB. How do you represent the delta t squared and the delta m? Yes, exactly. You need error box. So how do you represent error box? So let's say for example, you've got a point which is M and T, you've got a point which is 0 0.150 plus minus 0 0.001, and then um, T squared, T is T squared is 1.05 plus minus 0 0.05, say for example. Yeah? So you've got this point over here, this is 0 0.150, this is 1.05. So that is the point. So how do you represent the delta m, which is 0 0.01? 0 0.001. You draw a bar that is this over here. Now, this side, each side over here will be 0 0.001. So it's 0 0.001 on the right, 0 0.001 on the left. That will represent the answer. So that's the range of your values. Now the same thing for your y. In this case, this bar over here will be 0.05. 0 0.05 at the bottom, 0 0.05 at the top. So what I want to see is this. Okay? So a very nicely drawn double eye. You can see that two eyes intersect each other at 90 degrees. I think there's a software that does this uh, automatically, but uh, you can ask a series. Okay? So you have a series of points over there. Now this is the next part in the next phase which is very important. Yeah? How do you draw the line of SP? You must ensure that there are enough points and other than enough points you must have equal number of points on both sides. On both sides yes, right. So sometimes we do allow for plus minus one. So four and five is still acceptable, but not two and six kind of thing. That is totally unacceptable. Yeah? So 4 and 5, 5 and 6, still acceptable. Okay? But preferably 3 and 3 kind of thing. So let's say we draw a line of SP through this saber. So we draw the line of SP. But can you see that because of the uncertainty range, I can actually draw a line that goes like this. I can also draw a line that goes Can you see that because of the uncertainty, it allows me to have a range of gradient that passes through all the error bars. In fact, 
so long as it passes through this rectangle. This rectangle. This rectangle. This rectangle. So long as the line passes through all the rectangles, it is considered a possible line. Right? So other than the line of best fit over here, there is this thing called the maximum line and the minimum line. Maximum line that can pass through all the rectangle and the minimum the line with the minimum gradient that can pass through all the rectangles. So why is it important for us to draw the line of best fit and the maximum minimum line? Because you need the uncertainty for the, for the gradient. Yeah? So let's call this M0 and this one M1 and this one M2. So what's the uncertainty of a gradient? There are two ways of calculating. First, you take M1 minus M0, which is delta M, M0 minus your M2, which is also your delta M1, delta M2. Now, whichever bigger will be the delta M. So say, for example, if you take this minus this and find that this is 0 0.01, take this minus this and find that this is 0 0.03, then your delta M will be 0 0.03. And this is way number one. Number two, you straight away take M1 minus M2, which is the largest minus the smallest, divided by two, that will be your delta. So both ways are acceptable in IB. You choose whichever you feel for. Yeah. Okay. The normal rules for finding gradient holes, I want to see the two coordinates, the two coordinates, the big triangle that must be more than half a graph paper. M0, M1, and M2. Any questions? Isn't method one more accurate? Okay, sorry? Isn't method one more accurate? I personally prefer method one, but actually it's more troublesome. Yeah? Method two, you can actually find it in one step. Method one, you need to find two steps. But both are acceptable by IP, that's why I'm showing you. Yeah. So you choose whichever you think it's good for you. And that's it. You have your M with your delta M. So the M will be the uh, line of best fit M, the gradient of the line of best fit, the delta M you can find using this method or this method. Both methods are fine. So once you have your delta M, then you can plot into the 4 pi squared, 4 pi squared upon gradient, and that will get you okay. One last step. One last step. So I got the K equals to 4 pi squared upon the gradient, which is M. Can you see that M also has its uncertainty right now? So how do you find K's uncertainty? <laughs> Never end <ends>, though. <laughs> so this is M to the power of minus 1, right? Last time I mentioned whether it's minus 1 or minus 2, it doesn't matter, you just put the positive power power. So delta K upon K is equal to delta M upon M. So delta K is equal to delta M upon M times K. Delta m upon m times this thing, 4 pi squared upon m, which will give you delta m times 4 pi squared upon m squared. So this is how you complete your delta k. So once you come, once you come to this step, then is the end of the what you need to do for this step. Easy, no? Loads of processing. Yeah? It becomes second nature as you do more and more. Cool. So it's not difficult, I think. I think it is tedious. It is tedious. Let's face it, but it is not difficult. Cool. So what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this video so that in case you're not sure about anything, you can just play back, play back, play back until you are clear. Cool. Okay. And I'm happy to see that there are 15 views of the first video. Yes. I assume that all of you have been. Alright, so I'll stop this video here.